you. My name is Steve Blanford. I'm the state soil scientist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And we're here on Kegel Farms today in preparation for the NRCS, Davis County Conservation District Soil Health Field Day that will be held later. We're trying to get some footage to kind of go over the concepts of soil health and look at some soils on some different landforms and kind of basically discuss that all soils are not created equal. Different soils occur on different landforms and have different limitations and potentials. So that's what we're going to discuss today. Kind of like to start off with talking about the concepts of soil health and soil health management systems. Uh, the four principles being uh, no-till, uh, residue management, diversity of cover crops, and a living root 365 days a year. There's actually a fifth concept that doesn't apply everywhere, which is very applicable to this area. It is actually applying animal waste with the number of chicken barns and hog houses we have here. Very applicable, not just to this county, but to this region in general. So again, the four concepts of soil health and soil health management systems are no-till, residue management, diversity of cover crops, living root 365 days a year, and animal waste if applicable. Again, and the reason we do soil health management systems, first and foremost, number one is to prevent erosion. Because you can't farm what you don't have, so we have to keep that soil in place. And that's what this residue and this living root 365 does. It helps hold our soil in place. Erosion, the process of erosion, is raindrop impact creates detachment of our soil particles. It is movement of our soil particles and the deposition of our soil particles. So this residue management in these cover crops helps hold our soil in place and prevents erosion. The added benefit is the soil structure that is created through these systems. And what soil structure is, is the way the individual soil particles are held together. You guys a lot of times have heard of soil texture. What soil texture is, is the relative amounts of sand, silt, and clay in a sample. The way that sand, silt, and clay is held together is called soil structure, and you may have heard it of aggregates, and we talk a lot about aggregate stability. Of course, a good, healthy soil is made up of 25% air and 25% water. And the way they, we get that air and water exchange is because of soil structure. All right, where does soil structure come from? The residue that you see on the surface is food for the microorganisms. Just think about a tablespoon full of soil or an amount of soil that you could hold in the palm of your hand. There could be as many as two or three billion microorganisms in the palm full of soil. So if you look around, I can't imagine how many microorganisms would be in this field. The number would be astronomical. And what these microorganisms do is they need food, cover, and shelter just like we do. And the food is the corn stalks, the bean residue, the wheat chaff. And as they ingest this organic material and convert it to organic matter, they give off enzymes, sugars, starches, and a glue-like substance called glomulin. And it holds the individual soil particles together and creates that air and water exchange. A good way to think about that is, let's say we had a five gallon bucket here and it was full of baseballs and golf balls and marbles. And every place those golf balls, baseballs and marbles touch creates a space for air and water. They represent soil structure. If I dumped a gallon of water in that bucket, where would the water go? It would go in between the different pieces of soil structure. Let's say we had a five gallon bucket, same five gallon bucket, full of finished concrete. Okay, no internal structure. Poured a gallon of water on that bucket, where would the water go? It would run off and not become into the soil and become plant available. And our soils are reservoirs for water. Because as we all know, farming is all about the water. So let's say this five gallon buckets was a 55 gallon drum. Again, a bigger reservoir, more water. Farming's not only all about the water, it's about getting the water into the soil. And that's what this soil structure does. It reduces runoff, increases infiltration, and makes plant available water. Now the residue and the cover crops not only help build soil structure to get the water in the soil, they help cover the soil and prevent evapotranspiration, thus adding to more water when we need it.
What we're gonna do here is we said a little bit earlier that not all soils are created equal. Where they occur on the landscape position or where they occur in, in the world kind of detects what type of soil you have and the potentials and limitations associated with each soil. We're on a higher, more stable landform. As we get closer to the creek, those soils tend to be younger because they are getting materials that are washing off these higher soils. And as the creeks overflow, those sediments deposit and don't have quite as much development in the soil. As you guys look at this soil, pretty dark surface, about 12 inches of topsoil going into the lighter colored subsoil. And very excellent topsoil here. That is what these residue management and these cover crops do. As I talked about the ingestion of organic material into organic matter, the dark surface, this is where most of your root activity is, where most of your organic matter is. That's why it's darker on the surface. And uh, what I'm gonna do is peel off a little bit of this topsoil and look at some of this good structure. I don't know if you could see how that came out of there, but what we want is granular structure. And what granular structure breaks up close part very easily. You can see how that breaks out of there. If this was platy structure or bad structure, it would not come apart. So we want this good granular structure to create that air and water exchange. You can see that we have the roots in there and uh, good pore spaces, which is the air and water exchange. It shows where our microorganisms, our earthworms are working it up. You see how the roots are actually holding the soil together? Our roots, our cover crops, and our cash crops give off exudates, and those exudates help hold the soil particles together, building the soil structure. Excellent soil structure. This profile, again, has 12 inches of topsoil, and when we think of the potentials and limitations of these soils, this soil in general, when we're talking about corn yield, on an average year, we're looking at probably 220 bushel corn. On a year like we had last year in 2021, you were probably tipping 240, 260. Not all soils can do this. This is an excellent soil, has been managed well, has excellent topsoil, and is a very productive soil. We need to manage these soils to reach their potential. Soil health management systems will help us get there. We're still on the Kegel Farm here in Davis County. We've moved down slope. We, we're up at the soil that's about five feet higher than we are, and we're lower in the landscape position next to a drain. And again, these soils are quite younger, don't show the development. Again, different soils have potentials and limitations. This is an excellent soil. The Kegels are doing a great job here with their cover crops and well managed. Uh, Again, we talked about potentials up there was probably 240 bushel corn. Down here on average year, you're probably talking 240, 260. And I'm sure they knocked it out of the park last year in 2021 and got close to 300 bushel corn just because of the type of soil this is. To reach its potentials and limitations, we need to manage them to their fullest extent. Again, we looked at the soil up the hill and you saw a topsoil and a subsoil. We're down on an alluvial soil that is younger soil that's getting deposition from the creek and our soils that are washing from the hilltop. So you don't see really an A horizon. The whole profile is an A horizon. Excellent soil structure. The way it comes apart, you show the roots. We talked about the air and the water exchange, 25% air, 25% water. We've got to have that good soil structure to get the air and the water in the soil. We need that exchange. Water doesn't do us any good if we don't get it into the soil and make it plant available. Excellent soil, well managed to its potential. The Kegels are doing an excellent job. We're here on the Kegel farm here in Davis County preparing for the NRCS, Davis County Conservation District Soil Health Field Day. I'm here with Luke Kegel on their farm to talk about how he incorporates and the benefits that he sees from using cover crops on his farms. So Luke, if you don't mind, one of the benefits that we mainly see on our farm is obviously the largest being soil erosion and nutrient retention. The cover crop itself does add nutrients to it whenever you do a burn down and your biomass within the field after the foliage dies. You talked about you know the different kinds of cover crops. Again, we have nitrogen scavengers that will pick up any leftover nitrogen. We have 
cover crops for compaction, our radishes and our triticales and things like that. Uh, what type of cover crops do y'all use or what type of mixes? You know, I'm sure you don't just use the same cover crop every time. Wheat is a good cover and a good cash crop that we use. Um, recently, we've started using a mixture of uh, wheat, rye, and peas with some barley. Um, seems to have more roots going, running throughout the soil with a little bit better soil retention on it than just a straight wheat. And the, and the reason with this peas, the peas are legumes and they are adding nitrogen to the soil. Again, we like to use a mixture of cover crops because different cover crop species do different things and the roots attract different microbes. That's why we like to see a diversity of cover crops in our systems. And Mr. Kegels talked about the two or three different types that he uses. Excellent mixes. Again, erosion control, nitrogen scavenging, and then just helping our microorganisms create that biomass in the soil. Uh, how did you guys kind of get into cover cropping or how long have you been doing it? And you know, kind of why did you get into it? See, we plowed our last field back in probably about 2003. Of course, you know, as most things were going no-till. And equipment, uh, the equipment caught up. Our GPS system allows us to you know, plant precisely anywhere without needing to see where we've been. And I think that's probably one of the greatest things that allows a good coverage within a cover crop, but also uh, cost of running an implement, uh, less times over the fields, less wear and tear, less fuel, less labor. Um, and then, you know, there are the benefits that the cover crop itself provides. So just from a financial standpoint, it, it's just smarter to do no-till and from a conservative standpoint as well I mean you know be a good steward of the soil like this the lay of the land here if we were to plow this I mean this whole bank right here be in that ditch right there absolutely absolutely we can tell by looking at your soils you know again the the soil type up higher on the terrace you've got 12 inches of topsoil you know that that is kind of unusual and just outstanding so you guys are doing a good job of keeping your soil in place. A lot of what we're used to dealing with is also river sand, which is yes, highly sir. erodible. Um, and we've actually no-till our tobacco now. Um, I think we're one of the few that do that. Excellent, excellent. But, um, you know, I remember when we used to ridge the tobacco, and between each row of tobacco, you had a, a, a canyon that would just form in that old river sand. Yeah, and oh, absolutely. It would, tear, it would tear everything up, you know, any kind of equipment that you took out across that field just felt like you are destroying it. But now in our no-till, uh, like we'd come in here and it's just a strip about six inches wide, just long enough for, the, just wide enough for the tobacco plant to go into. So, I mean, you know, we found ways to no-till stuff that you know, a lot of the old timers said you can never do that. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's amazing The no-till tobacco, you know, it's a pre historically a very high-tilled cash crop. And then it's kind of where cover crops came from a little bit after tobacco was tilled so much. In the fall, we had to come in with a wheat crop so that we could maintain our bases to get price support. So that's kind of the inception of why we started using cover crops. So it's amazing to see that you guys are going to no-till on your tobacco. And are your yields pretty good? I assume your wheat can, weed suppression is probably pretty good, but what about your yields and managing your tobacco that is no-tilled? Our yields on tobacco have been They've been consistent. I, I don't think you could necessarily say you'd see as much of a difference uh, between no-till and uh, traditional uh, planting. Uh, I think one of the biggest things are season change. I mean, you know, we're wetter earlier. Um, uh, we used to plant tobacco later, but you know, now we, we try to plant what some would consider you know, way too early to do it, but that's, that's where we get our best. Um, but, you know, there again, tobacco, the money in it has become tight as well. And just any time you can take away an expense helps with everything. Absolutely. And, you know, you're, like I said, you're taking away an expense and you're helping the environment and you're helping, you know, your field for future generations. Yeah. Well, it's easy to see that you guys are good stewards of the land you have because you have excellent <coughs> soils and, and I'm sure you're getting excellent yields. Uh, you know, one of our big 
cover croppers throughout the state. Uh, a gentleman further west, he said that, you know, our farmers need to start farming by condition instead of by the calendar. And I think that's kind of what you're saying a little bit, and that's what our cover crops are helping us do, whether it helps us dry out quicker or whether it allows us to get in earlier or whatnot. Well, we plan on planting. Um, as a matter of fact, probably about as soon as the fields are ready to go, we're ready to go first week of March for beans. Last year was planted in beans and we planted it early. Um, and this field overall averaged 78 bushels an acre. Outstanding. Uh, I remember we planted uh, probably about mid-March. Come out here about every other day, you just look around, you say, well, beans will come through eventually. You just gotta have faith in that. But when you plant early, they set dormant for a long time in this. Hmm. Well, and we can see too, we're talking about residue management. We can see two years worth of residue. We can see your corn stalks from 2020 along with your wheat stalks from 2021. Again, the corn stalks are getting less and less, and that's because the microorganisms are incorporating them into organic matter. But, but again, residue management is where it's at, and you guys are doing an excellent job. We talk about you know residue management and cover crops. We create this high biomass out here, and it actually can create some problems for our farmers. We've had a lot of problems with uh, vole damage. You know, so I've seen some astronomical vole damage. Uh, Luke talked about some uh, slug damage that he's had. And again, we're asking our landowners to do this high biomass and cover crops, but it does create some problems for us. So look, if you will address that and maybe some of the, what you're doing to get away from those problems. Well, <clears throat> we did have an issue with slugs in this field. Um, but the most important thing, and really about the only thing, now there is a chemical, and I don't remember the name of it, but it's an expensive chemical to spray that will tackle slugs. But the most important thing is to have a well-maintained planter. And, you know, one that creates a good deep channel, drops your bean precisely into it, and then closes it. Uh, we had one row that um, we caught a little bit up on the hill where the closer was not lined up perfectly. And when I checked on it, you could see the beans and just a little sprout, but where that channel was open, them slugs had gone down through that whole channel and just, just went down the row and they right off top yep. of the off the seed. So there are things that you can do to help combat that. Yes. Yeah. And I've always heard is put down pressure on our planters to make sure that we get through the residue, but I had never really heard what you were talking about with the slugs following the rows. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, we're not saying that. Soil health management systems is a non-thinking man's game. It is a thinking man's game. You've got to think about your cover crops for your next year's cash crops and then potential problems and how to take care of these potential problems when they arise. And it sounds like the Kegels are doing on top of it and doing an excellent job. We've moved to a different section of the county and we're actually on a different landform over here. We're on Triple T Farms. We have Wally Taylor with us today and we're going to talk to him a little bit about the cover crop systems that he has and the management systems that he has going on on his farms. I wanted to start talking a little bit about this type of soil we're at right here. When we were over on Kegel's farms, we were on different soil types. We were lower on the landform, pretty much adjacent to the creek and had our floodplain soils and our little bit higher soils, our terrace soils, really good soils, really high yielding soils. We're on a true upland soil and it has a, a little bit of different characteristics associated with it. Again, as you remember me saying that each soils have potentials and limitations and it's based on the properties of the soil. This soil actually has a fragipan. A lot of you guys in the county have fragipans in your soils and it's kind of a yield limiting uh, operation. So again, you can see here that uh, while he's done a great job, he's got about six or seven inches of topsoil and he moves into the subsoil and the fragipan is actually starting at about 50 inches or 15 inches, excuse me. And you remember I said our soils are reservoirs and we have to get the water into the soil and make it plant available. Now again, the reservoir for this soil is only about 15 inches because of the fragipan kind of serves like concrete on a high dry weather, hot dry weather. So again, he's done a great job with his soil health management systems, got a good A horizon, got good soil structure for air and water exchange. But again, probably maximum yield on these on an average year, 160, maybe 180. Good year like last year where it was great conditions, probably had 180 bushel corn here. We'll ask Wally here in a, in a minute, but I uh, wanted to show you a little bit about 
our topsoil. We've broken it out here and you can see uh, different uh, cover crop species. This is our rapeseed and this is our wheat. You can see the topsoil crumbles out. Good topsoil, granular structure, a lot of roots. Again, the roots give off the exudates that help hold the soil particles together, making the soil structure. The reason why we like to see a variety or different species of cover crops is again, the cover crops have different jobs. The rapeseed, you can see, has more of a tap root. It does have some fibrous roots. Again, they attract different kind of microorganisms that help us build our soil structure. Again, that's a great example. Rapeseed, somewhat of a tap root with some fibrous roots on it, whereas our wheat cover crop is more of a fibrous root system more of a biomass cover crop, what helps with compaction, and it's also a nitrogen scavenger. That's why we like to see different types of cover crops because they encourage different types of microorganisms. Again, different type of soil, and the way Wally's managing it, great topsoil. He does have some limitations, but no fault of his own, the soil is what it is. We're over here on Triple T Farms with Wally Taylor, kind of asking him some questions about his soil health management system and how he got interested in using cover crops and kind of some of his curves. So I guess we'll start off, Wally, is how long you've been cover cropping, no tilling, and how you got started. Well, you know, my dad was cover cropping years ago, especially tobacco patches. Yes, you know, he, he didn't want to see a bear tobacco patch, so... Uh, you know, it's been a long time, but as far as uh, out in the crop field, uh, we have probably been doing it for 15 years at least to, to a point. You know, yes, it wasn't sir. as much as we're doing now, but so I'd say at least 15, 20 years. And your cover crop species, you know, I, I kind of look across here, it, it looks to me like it's some kind of wheat and rapeseed. And I guess tell us about some of the cover crops you use and how you plant them, broadcast them, and why you use the type of equipment that you use to get your cover crops established? All right, well, we use mainly wheat, uh, cover crop wheat. It's usually just combine run wheat. Uh, we put uh, rapeseed in with it, blend it in there ourselves, just the best we can. Spread it with a fertilizer buggy at about 50 to 60 pounds to an acre. And then we just run a uh, vertical till tillage over the corn stalks after we spread it, just one pass. And all you got to do is just rough the ground up, mm -hmm. just really make seed to soil contact, and it'll come up. And we have even not even dished it or you know worked it in lightly, and it'll come up. It's a little slower, but uh, as far as other things, we have experimented with uh, uh, Australian peas, I think. And, uh, of course we've done the radishes uh, the peas and the radishes if you don't get them sown early in which I'm thinking August they don't do a whole lot for the freeze kills we have done oats oats is pretty good it's just getting a big bunch of oats you know buying the oats the seed and everything but the oats will winter kill which is good for us because the fact is we don't we don't let our cover crops get real tall before we terminate them. So, yes, so those are the ones we have used over the years. You know, we hear a lot of times that, you know, labor, equipment, and you've addressed some of those issues. And, and cost is always a factor as well. So, you know, this 50 pounds of wheat and uh, rapeseed you have, what, what kind of costs are we talking about, Wally, or in general? I mean, obviously it changes year to yeah. year. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the wheat, uh, of course, we used to save the wheat ourselves when, when we were taking wheat to harvest. The last couple of years, we haven't been. So we've been buying the, the wheat from uh, one of our cousins down the road, and just we just take the truck to the wheat field. Now we pay him, we give him just you know, pay him market price, and maybe a little more just because it is cover crop wheat. But uh, it, it's still cheaper than buying it cover crop wheat in the bags but anyway you're I wish I could tell you what what wheat's going to be come harvest time but markets are crazy but uh, you know last year uh, 
whatever the market price was and then it probably was around six dollars I'm guessing maybe or leaving let around six dollars so that's what we paid for the wheat and 50 pounds you know that's six that's uh, six dollars an acre and the rapeseed I'm not sure what it cost uh, I'd have to look back but uh, it's not a whole lot so I think we're doing it for you know twelve to fifteen dollars an acre Pretty doable, I guess. You know. Well, for the benefits we're seeing out of it. So, And, and speaking of, of benefits, Wally, you know, you're, you're using these cover crops first and foremost to prevent erosion. Yeah. But secondly, you know, you get that better soil structure and you get that moisture in there. What are some of the benefits you're seeing, whether it's building soil health or yield or just better stewards of the land? Just What are some of the benefits you see in your operation? Well... Of course, like I said, it you know it was mainly for soil erosion, but we've noticed over the years uh, you, you got a root mass, and if you've got six or eight inches tall wheat, you've got a root mass down there. It's every bit of that. Yes, sir. And uh, that's that's good in the soil, plus with what dies on top. But uh, so we're seeing the soil erosion. We're seeing soil health, which I had told Dwayne uh, just last year that I the soil health is really kicking in you know I've really started noticing uh, how it helps the soil and you go around and pull up a clump of weed or or this rape and you'll find an earthworm absolutely you know just about every time you pull it up and you can go where you haven't cover crops and you might have to dig with a shovel to find some so so the soil health we're also seeing uh, weed suppression we're not having the winter annuals that makes it really hard to burn them down, you know, before you plant. So we got that, and um, well, it, especially where we're planting corn behind bean stubble with the wheat, the ground just sort of mellows out. It makes a nice, perfect little furrow trench to plant seed in. Yes, so sir. it's there's a lot of benefits that yeah. you know with it. We just can't put a dollar value on it. Well, and I'll say this too, we, we talked about water and you know, farming's all about the water, you, but you've got to get the water into the soil. All of our trucks are parked in this cover crop field. It's been pretty wet out, guys. So that water's getting in the soil. If it was not cover crop, we would probably have a hard time getting our vehicles parked right here. We'd probably be slipping around in the yeah, boat. Yeah. Uh, I guess, well, one other, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, obviously you're very successful with cover crops, been doing it for a while excellent stand right here we talk to a lot of landowners and we get kind of the same deal every time I, I don't have the equipment I don't have the manpower I don't have the time and cost what would you say to maybe encourage some of our landowners that are a little reluctant to get into the cover crop and residue management game well uh, I read a lot of articles on cover crop and across the country and uh, they anybody will tell you don't go into it big you know do you know experiment a little bit and I would uh, would think that um, you know try a few acres you know whether it's 10 acres or 20 acres or 50 and experiment uh, and and also talk to people that's done it absolutely you know it's absolutely. the experience that helps so uh, it's uh, You'll be surprised. That some people will tell you there's yield reduction doing no-till and cover crops. And, uh, you know, if, if there was a big yield reduction, we wouldn't be doing it. Absolutely. Uh, conserving moisture, shading the ground a little bit and holding the moisture in, it, you'll be surprised throughout the year how, how great your crop will look. So, you know, even if you had a yield hit, but on a dry year, you'd see a big advantage to it. So it's, I would mainly ask, start asking people, you know, that's doing it and getting a few pointers. Cause it's, you know, we've, we've got around a, a thousand acres of cover crops and it's, you know, it don't, we're doing it while we're harvesting, you know, it's, we just make time to do it. And some days we don't get anything done on cover cropping. The next day, you know, we'll jump in there and two guys will, will do it. Of course I would, prefer to have one piece of equipment to do it all but right now we don't have that so yeah. all right maybe another question uh, while you know 
we encourage you guys to residue management and cover crop, and it leads to problems. You know, there's always problems. Voles, mm -hmm. slugs, mm -hmm. army worms. Have, have you seen these problems, and maybe what are some of the things you do to, other than maybe pray at night to hope they go away? What, what do you do to try to, have you had problems, and what do you do to combat it? Yeah, we have had problems. Uh, last year was a was a big problem. Worst worst year we've had was slugs. We've uh, one thing we did several years ago. We found out by spreading potash in the springtime before we plant beans. It seems to hold the slugs down because our neighbors were having problems and we weren't. And that was the only difference we did. Last year that didn't seem to work too good. But the farm we had it real bad on had a whole lot of whole lot of cover, uh, corn stalks on it, and it sort sort of stayed wet. And we planted it. Uh, and at first we were blaming the cover crop as giving us a worse slug problem. But on that same farm, we had some ground we didn't put cover crop on, and we ended up going in there and working up where we didn't have the cover crop and replanting that whole field and where we had cover crop we just sort of spot planted so the cover crops wasn't really worse with the slugs than, than not of course you know working the ground supposed to help take care of them but we're trying not to do that so just grin and bear it I guess yeah, yeah but where we did have a ding in our populations was still some of our best beans all right Wally maybe do you have some final thoughts on soil health management and cover crops and residue management in general you'd like to get off your chest? <laughs> well, no, not really. I think we discussed it all. It's, it's uh, you know, what works for us may not work for everybody. Uh, I, you know, I did mention I'd like to have a no-till drill that, you know, 40 foot wide, seven and a half inch spacing to sow this wheat, just for the fact is it only take one of us to do it, but, uh, uh, we don't have that, so we're doing with what we've already got. And now everybody's everybody's got a disc or a tillage, a vertical till tool that can do this. Just so, scuff it in. Yeah. And yeah. so it's uh, you know it's just just get out and talk to people that's doing this, and and you'll learn something. Well, you've got an excellent stand here. You're doing a great job, and we appreciate you spending time with us. We've moved over to the eastern part of the county and we're here with Paul Winkler on Winkler Farms. Again, a little bit different setting, a little bit more rolling ground and Mr. Winkler's got some bottom ground and some upland ground here. And we're just gonna to talk to him a little bit about how he got into no-till and then cover crops and maybe some of the benefits he's seen throughout it. So, so Mr. Winkler, just kind of tell us how you got into no-tilling and moved into cover crops. Okay. I started no-till in 1984, was the first year I did no-till. A uh, fella up the road here, Cecil Farms, Tommy Cecil, uh, they were no-tilling at that time, and I went to them to ask them how you start no-tilling. And Tommy told me, he said, the last year that you're planning on tilling the soil, try to get it as level as you possibly can before you go no-till. Okay. And that's what I did. And we had the drought of 83, uh, essentially no production, Corn died before it ever got to the tassel stage, and beans were five bushels and, and tobacco less than a thousand pound acres. So I, I wish I'd been no-tilling in 83. I might have got a little bit more. But anyway, enough, probably one of the a big stimulus was I just didn't have the time to work the ground. I uh, went back into teaching, and I would farm after I got off, and you get the ground worked to plant tomorrow afternoon, it come a shower while you're at school. So you couldn't plant with no-till. The ground conditions are right, you can plant when you get there. And that was some of the stimulus of going no-till. And uh, I've been, I no-till started everything no-till on corn and beans in 84, except tobacco, and still had a mold board plowing back then, you mold board plowed, and then graduated just chisel plowing on tobacco. But I didn't do any no-till tobacco, I got out of tobacco. Uh, production the hurricane night year. That's a good year not to have tobacco. <laughs> yes, sir. And uh, so I didn't, uh, I did conventional till on the tobacco, but no till on everything else. And uh, a local farmer got me going to the no till conference back in the 90s, and uh, he's been no tilling for years and years and years. And uh, I like, Tommy told me that 
first year or two that you know till your yields might drop below what it is and, and most people think well if it's going to drop five bushel i'm not going to do it but you got to re remember you don't have as much cost in that acre because you're not running over the field as many times with equipment you got to look at net dollars per acre well and soil health management system is a, is a long game it, it's not a year-to-year -year game it's right. a you know the, the definition of soil health is the ability of the soil to sustain its intended use so again we're not talking about sustaining this year and next year we're talking about generations and generations and decades so it's glad to see that you kind of moved in that direction so what type of method and what type of cover crops do you like to, to use and obviously are they a little different on this upland ground versus your bottom ground well the i started uh, all the critical areas even before i started the cover crops i would use wheat or water or the hills come together and water collects I would no-till weed there to slow that water down over the winter and uh, but then after started cover cropping I went to cereal rye uh, there's a lot of benefits in my mind with that and I've learned it to no-till coppers cereal rye would germinate I think up 34 degrees soil temperature on up it germinate wheat when you get below 50 it might or might not it might be the spring before it germinates well, you can literally almost plant up to the ground freeze with a cereal rye and it will come up. So that was in my thinking, I'm gonna put cereal rye out there because that gives me a bigger window to get something up and get some cover before we have the winter set in. Uh, on this hilltop here, the first place I know till, uh, I did the 15 inch row cereal rye that year. The next year, uh, went to seven and a half inch row and had a mixture of cereal rye radishes and uh, turnips and clover yeah. no take that back no cereal rye it was clover radishes and turnips that mix mm -hmm. and then all the rest of it was cereal rye i like that to an extent i didn't have much response from the radishes and turnips as far as i don't know the germination just wasn't there we had a dairy for 46 years. If I'd have been a beef farmer, man, I had the best clover stand you'd ever seen in seven and a half inch rows. I was going to destroy, burn down. Had excellent results from that. Plus two, it was a kind of a pricey mix, but I was willing to try to see what it did. And uh, I went back this year, I'm 100% cereal rye. <laughs> I think I'll try those mixes in the future to see how it works. But uh, also the cereal rye, for some reason, it puts out a, I don't know what the, it exudes a liquid out of the roots that the microbes really like. They consume that and then in turn, their manure is what is used by the root hairs of whatever's growing. Absolutely. So uh, cereal rye also has got some kind of detriment to water hemp seed and water hemp in general, suppressing that. And I found three years ago that I got my first water hemp from a flood event, there's a farm upstream from me that had water hemp about five years ago from a combine come out of Sykeston, Missouri that just brought it in. Brought it in, yeah. and I finally got it. And water hemp followed the water line of the flood, but I had spread it through my machine, not knowing the year before that I had some of it in a corn crop. So. Well, that's interesting because you know at uh, Kegel's Farms and at Mr. Taylor's Farms, we we mostly talk about erosion control right. and then building our soil structure to get our water in and make it available to see the benefit of controlling weeds excellent smothers it out covers it up right. and uh, you know, i don't know what kind of rain you guys have had it's been pretty wet the last couple of weeks or so i'd say you've had three inches four inches of rain yeah at least pretty dry here right pretty, pretty daggone dry so the water is moving into the soil and then whenever you kill this back, we're going to prevent that evapotranspiration and it's going to hold that moisture and make it plant available. So doing an excellent job, heck of a cover here. You know, maybe what is what you think is the best benefit to your soil health as to what you're doing and what you've seen as you've started this process? Well, I can't really define any one thing because there's so many things it's doing. Uh, I knew cover crops would benefit well before I started, but I just didn't have the time to do it. And when I retired from my job, then I didn't have to 
go into that job. So now I can get my crop planted earlier and harvested earlier. Uh, a lot of people do the aerial. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Of course, you have to have X number of acres make it feasible, whoever's doing that. Sure. Plus, when you put it in the soil, you're going to get a better stand if you just scatter it out on top. So, so how do you plant your cover crops? I do it with a Great Plains drill, seven and a half inch rows is what I'm doing currently, but I've also done it in 15 inch with a corn planter. Okay. And that Great. works just as well. Great. And, Great. and might go back to 15 inch in the future, but I'm hoping to, my goal, with the, I quit farming and, and the boys, their goal too is we're hoping to get every acre cover cropped every year. We hear a lot of times, a lot of our landowners, we talk to them about soil health, no-till, residue management, and cover crops. When we kind of get the same answers every time, it's it's you know it's time consuming. I don't have the equipment, I don't have the manpower, I don't have the labor. It's too expensive. So what would you tell somebody that's not doing residue management and cover crops to try to encourage them and bring them into the fold, so to speak? If a person is doing no-till, they don't have the you know you don't want to spend a whole lot of money for the drill to do the cover crops. You can find at some of these auctions a real cheap worn out drill at say five six hundred dollars. Don't have much investment. Now it won't do the rate that you probably want to do but you can use a piece of equipment like that and get cover crop because it doesn't have to be like a corn planter oh, okay. precision like just getting the seed out there and getting some cover over here to germinate so a person could start that away try it on a small scale uh you have to kind of kind of have to learn how to do it you know i, I was lucky i talked to some people who had been doing it and they told me what not to do a lot of things so i didn't have to make those mistakes and, and a lot of times learning what not to do is almost as beneficial as what to do and uh, then went from there and uh, you know, my boys, they grow up all their experiences is no till. And uh, I was able in my job to convince some people to, to go to no till. And uh, what I've seen is most reluctant of going from minimum till to no till. If you're in a farming operation that has a lot of family labor, they provide the labor farm operation. If you go no till, you've got a piece of equipment that are not used. And the person that was occupying that driver's seat you have to find something else for them to do because they're not right in front of the planter. So, but if a person is limited on labor, no till would definitely be a thing to go just to have to where you can still provide your own labor. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Mr. Mink. We certainly appreciate it.